Okay, so that particular painting is called Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Rocket Falling, and it was painted in 1875. Um, and it drove one person to bankruptcy and another one to an early grave, so let's find out why. And I'd like to say thank you to one of our lovely um, commentators for the idea to do this video. Okay, so the painting was done by this chap, James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Um, He's an American chap, um, but he travelled the world a bit, lived in Paris for a while, and eventually he settled in London. Um, his probably most famous work is this one, which we, you may recognise, the famous Whistler's Mother. Okay, so he settled in London in the 1860s, and he became involved in something called the British Ascetic Movement. Um, they're the people behind the phrase, art for art's sake. And what they wanted was just art that was just you know, nice to look at or nice to appreciate. It was pretty or it was interesting or, you know, you could admire the brushstrokes. What they rejected was the idea that art should have any sort of moral purpose, that it should be inspiring or uplifting um, or reflect, you know, religious traditions or history. Um, they were very, very influenced um, by Japanese art and they experimented. They were sort of the first of the abstract um, sort of painters in a way. Um, and that did cause quite a bit of controversy, including with the other character in this play, um, Mr. John Ruskin. Now, Ruskin was a pretty amazing guy. He was a proper polymath. He was a writer. He was a lecturer. He was an artist in his own right. Um, he became the first um, Slade Professor of Fine Art at Oxford. And while he was there, he had this... Um, he was like an early socialist and he was very much into sort of moral character building so he had all his undergraduates digging ditches and building roads uh, including a young Oscar Wilde who apparently uh, quite enjoyed the experience. Uh, his university lectures at Oxford were so popular that he had to quite often do them twice. He'd do them once for the students and then again he'd do them just for anybody who wanted to turn up and he used to do this. He went out, he lectured, um, he was very popular with the sort of new aspiring newly wealthy middle classes but it was also very very popular with um, what we disparagingly call the the working class and he did lots of lectures there and he also produced um, a magazine or a journal the journal was called Fors Glawigira uh, Letters to the Workmen and Labourers of Great Britain and it covered everything from politics to philosophy to culture and the arts and Ruskin used it to promote his idea that art should have some higher moral purpose it's you know it should be useful for society it should inspire you to do wonderful and great things so anyway anyway uh, one day in 1877 on a nice summer evening um ruskin went to the opening of the grosvenor gallery in london and they were actually presenting a series of works that had been rejected by the royal academy of arts um, and he was very interested to see you know how things were moving um, and he was particularly enamored with the paintings of somebody called Edward Byrne Jones. Um, he was a pre-Raphaelite. I won't go into what that necessarily means. Um, but effectively, that was all, you know, all about the romanticism of painting. Um, all that old school things that painting should actually mean something and have a message. Um, and Ruskin was very impressed. However, on uh, one of the walls, there was also um, Nocturne. And it's fair to say Ruskin had a slightly lower opinion of that, and in his next edition of his journal, he wrote a review. So Ruskin, in the journal, he sang the praises of um, Burne Jones, uh, saying this was simply the only artwork that um, will ever be seen in England in the future as a classic. But when it came to Nocturne, um, he put it like this. I have seen and heard much of Cockney impudence before now, but never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. So it's probably fair to say that he wasn't very enamoured with the painting. And incidentally, the 200 guineas was how much um, Whistler was actually asking for the painting. So again, you know, he was he was, he was was very commercially minded. He wasn't painting for, you know, <laughs> it might be art for art's sake, but it was also art for profit. So obviously um, the article came to Whistler's attention and it's probably fair to say he saw a bit of an opportunity here. Um, so he issued a claim for defamation um, and he sued for what was then the grand sum of a thousand pounds, which in today's money is a lot more. Um, he, 
but what he wanted really was a to just publicize his art because you know he'd never miss a commercial opportunity but also he lived quite an extravagant lifestyle and he'd racked up a lot of debt uh, so he had quite a mercenary um, motive to do this um, and yeah and the trial came on it was actually heard at the old bailey um, and it ran for two days however ruskin himself by this stage he had become so traumatized by everything you know that he it really affected his health and he couldn't attend himself so he actually sent um burn jones along to represent him and he's also able to secure the services of the then attorney general as his barrister um so this is this is a very 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 high profile case um suffice it to say um what happened well whistler actually won however he was awarded one farthing in damages um, and no costs. And what was the effect of that? Well, the effect of that was um, he was bankrupted. Um, I also use that Daniel Defoe quote. Um, I have been ruined but twice, once when I lost a lawsuit and once when I won one. And this was a very painful example of that for you know all, par all parties involved. So Whistler was forced to sell his house and basically he ended up uh, just taking commissions around Italy for paintings um, just as a jobbing painter. And poor old Ruskin, uh, he never really recovered from this. He pretty much gave up on criticism because he said, well, what's the point? I can't do my job um, of commenting on things if everybody's going to come out of the woodwork and um, sue me. Uh, so, yeah, so that's very interesting. I mean, and to look at what would happen today, um, you know, obviously art criticism, arguably that's the very definition of opinion um, and something that, um, you know, cannot be defamatory. But there is also in defamation in common law countries, there's this been this idea that disparaging somebody in their trade or profession has always been a slightly lower threshold for defamation. Um, what would happen today? Who knows? Um, but... Uh, Arguably, this was the first of the slaps. But anyway, I hope you found that uh, interesting. Um, please let me know in the comments if you'd like me to expand on these or do them longer or do them shorter or, you know, stop rambling and cut to the chase. Or no, no, we'd like all the Easter egg trivia um, that surrounded the case. But once again, thank you to our lovely commentator for suggesting this. And I've really enjoyed it. And I hope to see you all again next time very soon.